Bisa dengar nggak suara saya? No, I know it does this every time. <laughs> every time. I saw that at the end of the I can't even hear it. Uh, anyone on the live stream? Test, test. Yeah, sound. Yep. Good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. We have music playing. You can keep it playing. Uh, um, uh, well, we're getting set up here. 8 a.m. Morning, everyone. We can uh, fade the music. So I uh, hope everybody's doing well. The Thursday before uh, midterm two, which is uh, Monday, uh, same time in the evening as last time, but on the Monday this time. Last Monday was a holiday. And the uh, alternate exam time for you guys in uh, difficult time zones is 6 a.m. Pacific Tuesday morning. Um, so Sydney coordinates that. If you have a if you have a request uh, to do the alternate uh, time zone, then give us a shout. So we were talking last time about electronic configurations and. We understand now that we have electrons. They're trapped in a potential well around a nucleus. And they form these standing wave patterns. And the standing wave patterns are quite um, uh, multifarious. Uh, there's a bunch of them. They, and we're labeling them now. So it was easy when it was 1D. We just labeled the wave functions 1, 2, 3 by their quantum numbers. We're going to continue to label them by their quantum numbers, but there's more quantum numbers. In fact, we've got up to four quantum numbers. There's the three spatial quantum numbers, N, L, and M sub L. So we'll label our wave functions with those three quantum numbers. And then there's a... A uh, fourth quantum number <clears throat> we call the spin of the electron that determines the uh, magnetic orientation in each individual orbital. So I'll use that term orbital and wave function interchangeably now. So if I say orbital, I mean one of the possible standing wave functions. And when I say m sub s the spin, there are two orientations of the electron spin that can occupy any orbital. So the idea that it's a wave function and that it describes one electron is still true. So an orbital describes uh, where an electron can be. We found that the Hund's rule said the electrons want to go in spin parallel so when you fill when you put electrons into orbitals when you say which ones are actually occupied you say i'm going to put them in spin parallel first all spins up or all spins down it doesn't matter and we try to fill degenerate orbitals orbitals of the same energy all spin parallel first. So we were doing that when we stopped last time. So the 1s, we're up to carbon now. So we're going to fill carbon up to its neutral state. So carbon atomic number 6, Z, charge on the nucleus, plus 6, neutral atom, 6 electrons. So we're going to put 6 electrons into these wave functions, into these orbitals. And the first two, the core electrons, go into the 1s, that's principal quantum number uh, n, 1. L, the second, the second quantum number, the uh, angular momentum quantum number, is 0, which we also give the symbol s. 
And there's an m sub l, also 0, but we don't put that there because all it can be is 0 when l is also 0. So the quantum numbers for this electron are 1, s, 0, m sub l, and n sub s plus 1 half. And then there's another one in that same orbital, same numbers, 1, 0, or s, 0 for m sub l, and spin down. So m sub s minus 1 half. So we can have these four quantum numbers, and we continue as we fill electrons 2s, spin up, spin down, and then the 2p orbitals will fill. So now the quantum numbers have changed n equals 2, l equals 1, m sub l, we have the values x, y, z, or minus 1, 0, and 1, and spin up, or m sub s, plus 1 half. So that's a fairly straightforward thing to do. We're going to put in up to 6 here, 2, 4, 5, 6. And notice I put them in spin parallel before I occupy a second, uh, uh, second equally degenerate orbital. So uh, electrons occupy degenerate orbitals, orbitals of the same en energy, uh, spin parallel first. They don't try to occupy. It's actually more energy to put them in. There's that magnetic interaction, one spin up, one spin down. That's actually higher energy situation. You'd rather go in with all your magnetic fields pointing in the same direction first before you start uh, going, uh, having that energy of anti-magnetic interaction. They, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I guess only half of us are... Uh, or something like half of us identify as male uh, and use the, the male restrooms. Uh, to this, this situation for men is obvious. When you, when you, when you go into a, a men's restroom, there's a bunch of urinals along the wall. And of course, we, <laughs> we occupy them. We just, if, if there's one guy here in this uh, urinal, the next person to come in goes to the farthest away possible urinal <laughs> and stands here. There's no way we're going to occupy the same stalls at the same time. And that's kind of what spin is. The fact that I can put another electron in the same wave function is akin to saying that fourth quantum number, spin, is a time variable. You could think of it that way formally if you'd like, that this one is here during spin up time. The other one is down there during spin down time. That's why they can occupy the same, essentially the same wave function around an uh, orbital. Uh, the rules, <laughs> actually, the rules of uh, of occupying orbitals, same as occupying stalls in the bathroom. Uh, so here, let's say there's these stalls in the bathroom. First person comes in and goes here. Obviously, the next person to come in goes here, clearly. That's easy. The next person, let's say, oh, my eraser is suddenly not working at all. Hmm. Eraser is broken. Let's say um, there's a person that comes in here. Now, again, you, you go down here. The As the people come in, if there's also someone here, now this guy has a tough choice. Does he go here or here? And obviously, if you have been in a restroom, the fourth person to come in goes here. And that might be counterintuitive, but there's a coupling rule. You don't want to be associated with the coupling at this end. So you go with the three on that end. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm making all this up. Nothing to do with chemistry. In fact, uh, Sophia was here yesterday uh, in the room with us. And at the end, she said, uh, what kind of chemist are you? <laughs> like... What kind of chemist are you anyway? Are you even a chemist? 
<laughs> she wanted to see my ID card <laughs> to make sure <laughs> that I was really certified. I, I don't think I am. So electronic configurations look like this. We write 1S2, 2S2, 2P1, 2P1, and you can put 2PX, 2PY there if you'd like, including the M sub L value. Uh, it's, not, it's not super important most of the time, but sometimes we'll write it, sometimes we won't. And here I'm writing the electronic configuration. This is shorthand for all this, and that's the shorthand notation we're gonna use all the time. And as I said, you have to memorize these values of L and letters. L equals zero is S, L equal one is P, L equals two is D, L equals three is F. We've seen that. Uh, and that's unfortunately something you just have to memorize. We try to get away with that, get away from that uh, in chemistry. But that thing, unfortunately, is language. You have to, you have to uh, memorize it. So this magnetism issue. So these electrons are unpaired two unpaired electrons, and that gives the overall atom a magnetism because each individual electron has a magnetism. And if they're parallel, they're not canceling each other out. They're called, that's a magnetic species, and this is called a paramagnetic species. If you have at least one unpaired electron, you have some paramagnetism. You're diamagnetic if all your electrons are paired and all the little spins are canceling each other out. So as we continue now, here's nitrogen, more paramagnetic because the third electron, one more charge Z in the nucleus, one more electron to make it neutral, has this electron configuration. And now the next electron, as we go across the periodic table here, is oxygen. And the next element, oxygen, has the eight uh, two, four, six, seven, eight electrons, and it will spin pair one of the P's. The reason is, again, I've written these on a straight line, but the three S is higher, is actually higher in energy. So the electrons are going to go according to the Aufbau principle to the lowest possible energy wave function first, and then fill up. That's not super obvious here, but you know, one, two, and three give you the overall energy and three is higher energy than two. These are higher energy. I feel like this. And now I have a, um, a 1s2, 2s2, 2p4 you could write. You could collapse all the p's into one and just say that's 2p4 or writing it out 2px2, 2py1, 2pz1. And now your magnetism has been reduced a bit because you paired one of the electrons in the P's and we can do the rest, okay? So this is the Gilligan's Island thing and the rest in that row. <laughs> That's probably too old a reference. Anybody know what Gilligan's Island is even? It's an old, yeah, okay, forget that. It's an old TV show, Google it someday. There were seven people stranded on this island and in the intro credits, they sang the song and named all of them except two and they called the two and the rest. <laughs> It was, it was the professor and Marianne didn't get credit. <laughs> anyway, so uh, you can see the magnetism changes. And now I have collapsed these P electrons into uh, the shorthand to make it a little easier. You don't have to write out all the Ps. And uh, we know if you write 2P4, we know that it looks like this, that it's two paired and two unpaired. Uh, when I get down here, I even shorten the notation some more because neon finishes, it closes the N equal two principal quantum level. So when I write sodium, I write this neon, that's the uh, element neon in uh, brackets. That means sodium has everything neon has and a 3s1 electron. So that's the shorthand we'll use, and we'll write electronic configurations. We'll keep track of the magnetism of the species. Uh, and uh, I think we'll be talking the same language. So this is these are all uh, language arts we're learning here today, mainly. So let's try to use them. When an electron spin flips 
for which of the following is the energy not altered? So I'm going to flip a spin from spin one half to spin minus one half, or if it was minus one half back to one half. I'm going to flip one of my electron spins. Can I do that without altering the energy of nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine? Let's think about that for a second, and we'll take a vote.
Okay, it looks like many of you have voted. Let's come back and talk about this one. Push your button if you want to register your thought. And we'll have a look. Oh my goodness, uh, equal, I don't know if I'm blocking that, equal distribution for all three. This one um, tougher than we thought. So here are, we'll go through it, We'll always go through them all together, but um, let's go through it together. So the question is, can I flip an electron and have it be indistinguishable from what it was previously? So all these guys have flippable electrons. That is, flippable means it's it's there by itself in a uh, single occupied orbital. Once you have two electrons in an orbital, then flipping them is very hard. So if they're para uh, anti-parallel, flipping them back to parallel in one orbital, that's virtually impossible to do. That's a hard, high energy. It's, uh, it's quantum mechanically disallowed. So that uh, doesn't happen. But these could all be up or down. The question is, is up or down the same energy? Is it the most preferred state? So if you flip one of these in nitrogen, uh, it looks like you could flip it. And yes, it, it, it could be up or down. The thing of it is, we have this rule that says the lowest energy is all the spins parallel in degenerate orbitals. So if you're putting in spins, you're putting in electrons, in degenerate equal energy orbitals, you put them in parallel first. That's Hund's rule. Because having one of them anti-parallel, that's higher energy than all the magnets parallel. So even in separate orbitals, if they're equal energy, they go parallel first. So flipping this spin, that's actually, it's very slight uh, uh, energy. But it's a you know it's a it's a photon's worth a it's about a visible photon's worth of energy not very much um, probably quite a bit less than a visible photon worth of energy to do that this one same case but this one remember as you're filling them as they go in the first one that goes in can be up or down or in this case the last one so this doesn't matter in fluorine whether that is spin up or spin down, those are the same energy. So fluorine doesn't change in energy. It's indistinguishable if that is spin up or spin down. And that is the point. These could have all gone down, 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 up, up, and then that would have been down. It looks like we kind of did it up, 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 down, down, and that was up, but either way works. And indeed, as I write it, that could have been up or down. All right, fantastic. Ground state absorption, which species in its ground state exhibits an N1 to N2 absorption? So fluorine, now here's fluorine with a minus charge. So you know that has an extra electron and here's sodium. So which one of those in its ground state has an n equal one to n equal two absorption. Think about that for a second and we'll take a vote. Here's the good information. I think they're all uh, here that you want to look at but you have these printed out. Talk about that for a second, we'll take a vote.
Okay, we can come back together as a group and see what you're thinking. So press your button if you have not done so. Uh, again, we're uh, quite spread out. B is slightly more popular, but not uh, not uh, in not decisively so. So let's see what you're thinking. The idea here is, I want to go from n equal one to n equal two. I want to absorb a photon of light and go from n equal one to n equal two. <clears throat> so the requirements would be number one: I have an electron that can absorb that energy and go from n equal one to n equal two. The second uh, would be there's space in n equal two. So n equal two is full if you're fluorine minus. Fluorine minus, we have to add an electron. So we add an electron the way we normally would have done it. The next electron to go in, even if it's making this negative species, still goes in the lowest possible energy level, which in this case is one of the two P's. I haven't labeled them there. It could be the X, Y, or Z. It's 2P5. When you go to fluorine minus, the electron configuration of fluorine minus is 2P6 as an extra electron. So there's no room there. And sodium, also full in the N equal 2 level. So there's no room in the N. You can't do that transition. So that transition, those transitions are just not allowed if you're fluorine minus or sodium because there is no unoccupied orbital. There's no space in the n equal two principal quantum level. So I can't do that. This brings up uh, one of those interesting uh, points here. Um, when you write an electron configuration, you write a number of electrons and you write the electrons around the nucleus and you put in a bunch of electrons around a nucleus, does that determine what the element is? Hmm. Remember, if you take nothing else home from chem one, take home the fact that the only thing that determines what the element is, is the number of protons in the nucleus, period. So if I see this electron configuration, 2p6, that looks like you might say that looks like neon because it has that those uh, 10 electrons there. But no, that's a fluorine. It just has a negative charge. The electron configuration does not determine what the element is. So someone has to tell you it's neutral fluorine, and then you would write this. But if I said which element can have that electron configuration, you can't answer that. You need more information. I can't just give you electron configuration and ask you what element it is. Okay? I might do that. <laughs> so beware. <laughs> it's important to me that you understand it's only the number of protons in the nucleus. Okay. So uh, we'll do this one together. For which species does paramagnetism increase when you ionize? So now ionization is the electron leaves the element or the molecule. You eject an electron. So our photoelectric effect, that was those are ejections of electrons. They're leaving the metal or leaving the element or leaving the molecule. Uh, I was writing exam questions uh, last night, and uh, that's how I showed ionization. I showed ionization as, uh, and I know you hate it when I do that, <laughs> mix two things together. Ionization and photoelectric effect are the same thing. So it's electrons leaving uh, a substance. That's ionization. So uh, just be aware <laughs> on the exam, if the question makes it on, these, these guys might kick it off. Uh, that you may see me talking about ionization in terms of the photoelectric effect, which is totally fair. That's what it is. Uh, we call that ionizing radiation. You may have heard that term, and that's dangerous radiation. So most radiation that is in the atmosphere is relatively safe. We talked about that. Radio waves are safe. Microwaves are relatively safe. 
Um, some radio waves, uh, there's uh, some research that's saying maybe it's not so safe if we're really having prolonged and close contact with them. So your cell phone operates, if you're a Verizon customer, at 700 megahertz is its frequency. So, and holding that or having it close to your body, having it close to your head all day, uh, that might be dangerous. The research isn't conclusive yet. But ionizing radiation that is higher than the visible is dangerous because electrons do leave. And if they leave a chemical bond, if they leave a molecule, then that bond can be broken. And that is what happens when you have uh, ionizing radiation. That's kind of what causes some cancers. You break the bonds in a DNA molecule, and that causes a mutation. So dangerous radiation to be ionized, but which species will have an increase in paramagnetism? And carbon, nitrogen, and neon are our options. So here are the electron configurations of neutral neon, nitrogen, and carbon. I'm going to ionize. Will the paramagnetism increase? Do I pick up an extra unpaired electron? And the only one that will get an extra unpaired electron is neon. So neon, electron leaves. I have one unpaired electron left behind it. It was diamagnetic. After ionization, Ne plus is paramagnetic. These guys are all paramagnetic to start with. And when you eject an electron, their paramagnetism decreases. They have fewer unpaired electrons. Screenshot if you want to, and go. Uh, so which species can have the electron configuration, helium, 2s2, 2p5, 3s1? We'll go through this one together as well. So now I have an electron configuration, and here we are talking about the same thing. Any of these elements, sodium and fluorine, can have that electron configuration. It's still sodium or fluorine. It just happens to have a charge. The element doesn't change. So which can have that electron configuration? And look at this. It looks like an excited state configuration. That is. 2p5, 3s1, there's an electron up in 3s that doesn't belong there because there's room in the two principal quantum level. So this is an excite, I don't even say that, it's an excited state configuration. And which orbital have I drawn here? This is actually an exam question. Um, I would make it maybe a little more obvious. Um, I would have it shaded, or I would put the sign of the wave function. But if I do that, you should be able to identify which orbital. You should be able to give me some of the quantum numbers there. Because it's got that spherical symmetry, so it's an S. And it has a node, one radial node. So that means it can't be the 1s. The 2s can have one radial node because the total number of nodes are n minus 1. It has one node. The angular nodes are L. L is 0 because it's an s. So it's not an angular node. It must be a radial node. So the 2s orbital is pictured there. Those are the kind of things I want you to be able to do. Go from pictures to quantum numbers. And uh, uh, we'll talk about this now. Here are the electron configurations. And the question is, which could have this uh, electron configuration? And uh, there you go. Sodium plus could have that electron configuration. Fluorine minus could have that electron. Oop, could have that electron configuration. So two of those can have that electron configuration. 2p5, oh, for goodness sakes, my, my shirt is touching the screen. Here are our 2p5 
uh, electrons, and here's our 3s1. Sodium itself has, here's its p's, 2p6. So two different elements, fluorine plus, uh, fluorine minus, sodium plus ions can have that electron configuration. So you get a little stressed out about quantum mechanics and uh, don't get too stressed out. Uh, the kind of questions on the exam you're gonna see are like these uh, chem quizzes. I'm not asking you uh, to um, derive, write down mathematical uh, quantum mechanical phenomena. I'm asking you to understand the results, that is quantum numbers, what those quantum numbers mean in terms of nodes and shapes and energy levels. Those are the kind of things we need to uh, take home from all this. So let's continue. Uh, we've already talked about now uh, quite a bit, so we'll go through this quickly. We can calculate the actual energy of the transitions. We did that before. We have the energy, if I change, if I go from one level to another level, the energy is final state minus initial state. So if the energy is z squared minus z squared over n squared, then if I go from the final, uh, the initial state to the final state, I take 1 over n final squared minus 1 over n initial squared times z squared minus z squared r, and I get that energy spacing. And those are the energies that I'm concerned about. In general, again, zero can be anywhere on this scale. We know for hydrogen and the atoms, zero is at the top of the board, top of the energy scale. But the differences are what we measure. Those are the photons that we can uh, absorb or emit. So that's what we can detect, and that's what's important. The differences, the delta E's, are the important. I won't. Uh, uh, we'll frequently ask you about changes. The actual energy levels are kind of easy because it's just z squared over n squared times r. So the actual energy of the level, since we know this value r, is uh, straightforward. Okay, so we can do transitions. So if you look at the hydrogen atom, it has these energy levels, and I've got them written here, the uh, first principal quantum level minus R energy, minus a quarter R in energy there, and minus um, a ninth of a Rydberg there. These are just numbers. They happen to be negative. That's OK, because in general, we just want to know these differences. And if you do transitions, and start to draw out all the possible transitions, these energies are actually pretty high. They're in the ultraviolet range. If you talk about principal quantum levels, uh, transitions involving the second principal quantum level as the, the destination or the origin. So the first principal quantum level as the destination or origin, you get uh, high energies. The second, there's these visible transitions. So hydrogen emits in the visible spectrum if the transitions are between, uh, involve the second principal quantum level. So either absorbing visible light or more importantly, usually emitting visible light. And these, uh, these series of frequencies have names. We don't really uh, care about Mr. Lyman and Mr. Balmer who maybe uh, discovered them. But the interesting thing is that those three transitions from three to two is a red uh, photon, four to two is a green, and five to two is a blue. <clears throat> and then beyond that, six to two is an ultraviolet. We wouldn't be able to see that with our eyes, but you can see this. Um, and it's interesting, spectroscopy works anywhere. You should be aware, we could do this in the lab. We could excite hydrogen atoms and then look at them with a spectrometer and see, resolve these frequencies. But there's hydrogen in the stars. <laughs> if you look out to the stars, hydrogen in the stars are doing this. So we can see 
this light, and if we take the light from the stars and put that through our spectrometer, which we can do, we can see these individual lines. And they're characteristic of coming from hydrogen. That's how we know there's hydrogen in the stars. So hydrogen waves to us from space with this spectrum. Uh, another thing we can do is we can tell if the hydrogen uh, kind of what it's doing. Say a star is flying away from us very fast. We're separating in space. Then these frequencies, these wavelengths, they get distorted a little bit. They get shifted by a Doppler because it's moving away from us. So the wavelength uh, looks a little longer. And we can tell how fast they're moving away from us by how much the spectrum deviates from these numbers. So there's some astrophysics uh, right there. One of the ways we can tell the universe is expanding. Kind of, it's going in so many directions, it's hard to do it just from this, but we can see things moving away from us, at least. A lot of things moving towards us. So that's kind of cool. Uh, spectroscopy in space. <laughs> that should be a TV show. Spectroscopy in space. Which transition in HE plus occurs at 487 nanometers? That's the same as the four to two in hydrogen. So is there a helium plus ion em emission? Oh, I got this giant cuff. Bad shirt for this. Uh, is there a helium plus emission that would look like a hydrogen four to two? And the four to two transition in hydrogen is that green photon at 487 nanometers. Let's talk about that for a second and we'll take a vote. Oh, I'll talk with you, Sky. You're right here. So, uh, what do you think about this? This one, boy, this one is, thank you.
Okay, so we've had a good discussion here in the studio. Uh, also, uh, <laughs> my office, same time. Uh, what are you guys thinking? So go ahead, press a button if you have not yet. We'll see what the distribution says. Uh, spread out again. So these are um, these are hurting us this morning, are hurting our brains. Uh, we have A and C more popular than B. So here I've just sketched out a bunch of the principal quantum levels. I haven't done it uh, to scale. These spacings obviously aren't to scale. What I just wanted to point out is hydrogen, the energies are going to go like 1 over n squared times r, of course. R doesn't really matter that much because it's the same in both of them. The helium levels are going to go 4 over n squared because z is 2 for helium. So we have z squared over n squared here. So the energy levels for helium go like 4 over n squared. They go like 1 over n squared to uh, in hydrogen. And we have to find a spacing that lines up. And you can go through all the math. But here we have the 4 level to the 2 level. That's 1. Oh, Lord have mercy. This is 1 16th R. The 2 level is 1 quarter R. Why? I'm putting in the principal quantum level. 4 squared 16, 2 squared 4. So the difference there. Is that the same difference? You just have to look at the differences here. This is 4 over 8 squared. That's 64 R. 4 is 4 over 4 squared, 16 R. And you can then see that line up or do the math. 4 over 64, that's 1 over 16. 4 over 16, that's 1 quarter R. So that spacing and that spacing are the same. And we can find those transitions where those transitions line up. OK, let's look at the ionization energies. Um, so if you ionize these species from their ground state. If it's a one electron system, easy to calculate because one electron systems behave exactly like this. Their energy is uh, goes as z squared over r, r squared. So to ionize from the ground state, which is where we expect to find one electron systems, the electron is in the lowest possible energy state. The amount of energy is z squared over uh, one in this case, the the ground state energy. So if you ionize from any state, you have to put in z squared uh, over n squared times r joules of energy as a photon of energy. So you can convert that into a photon. You can convert that into the wavelength. And that's what you'll do on the exam. When we talk about these energy spacings, we often talk about them in terms of photon wavelength. You've seen that already. I keep giving them to you in wavelengths, not joules. This gives you joules. You have to go to uh, nanometers. You have to convert that to uh, wavelength. H times nu gives you the frequency. H times C over lambda gives you the wavelength of that number of joules of energy. So here are the... Uh, uh, possible ionization energies. Let's just look. It's kind of interesting. So <clears throat> it takes an ultraviolet photon to ionize hydrogen. So we're going from the ground state to infinity state, the zero in energy, quantum number infinity. What is that energy? Well, it turns out that one's easy. That's uh, a Rydberg. This is a mole. This is joules per mole. 13, 12 joule, kilojoules per, or joules per mole is a Rydberg. There is the uh, uh, kilojoules per mole. That is the ionization energy for a mole of hydrogen atoms. 
mole of helium atoms, also easy to calculate exactly because in that case, Z is just two. Okay, so that's four times as much energy to do that. That's totally as what we would expect to see. What about if you start adding electrons? This is interesting. So now I'm going to do ionize the helium atom, 1s2. So it has two electrons. Now, I should tell you that uh, quantum mechanics, I told you, beautifully solves one electron systems, absolutely precisely. It's the, it's the most uh, perfect um, mathematical model in science. But the uh, once you put a third body in, you put an extra electron, so the simplest next step, a nucleus and two electrons, cannot be solved in a closed form mathematically. So everything we do for all the rest of the atoms is an approximation. We use, we use uh, kludges and, and approximations and patches to quantum mechanics. It, it, it's still quantum mechanics, but we use uh, approximations for the rest of them. It's actually well known in science, the three body problem it's called, can't be solved with a closed form differential equation like the two body problem can. So even if you have three planets, any, things, any three things moving, a sun and two planets, it can't, you can't predict their motion indefinitely in time perfectly with a simple differential equation. It's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a crazy annoying problem in, in science. <clears throat> it seems like you should be able to do it. Cannot be done. So this is an approximation, uh, but we can approximate it. We can measure it to see how good our approximations are. So what happens? Well, you put an extra electron in. Where is the ground state energy now? Is the ground state energy minus four Rydbergs? Well, you already have to start, you already have to be starting to think about that. Well, one electron can see the has the whole nucleus to itself. If there's two electrons, then does it get to see all those two positive charges? Well, the experiment tells us probably not because the ionization energy is lower to take off one of the electrons. So taking off one of the electrons, there's an effective nuclear charge that we'll define that says, when there's two electrons there, they each don't see the full plus two. One of them partially shields the positive charge from the other. That's called shielding. And it's this small effect. It causes Z effective to be a number. We're not going to define Z effectives exactly ever in this class. But it's smaller than two but bigger than one. So this, if it were one full charge, the ionization energy would be here, just like hydrogen. If it were two, it would be just like here for helium plus. It's in between those two. So that happens to be uh, about uh, 2,300, 2,400 kilojoules per mole. Uh, it's not half. OK, of that. So uh, less than half of what you would expect that to be. But here's something interesting. What if you look at the excited state helium in the 2p? So in if one of the electrons is in the 2p and I excite it, so now the helium looks like this. One of the electrons is down here. The other electron is here. And this transition, what's that transition? What's that ionization energy? Well, that turns out to almost exactly overlap with hydrogen. So it looks like that guy is behaving like it's a one electron, one proton system. So what that seems to be telling us is that the S electron So you have an electron here 
an electron here, and we want to ionize that guy. And when we ionize that guy, it's the same as if it was hydrogen being ionized. This guy has plus one. This guy has plus two in the nucleus down here. So it looks like Z effective in this situation for that electron there is almost exactly one. It looks like this electron perfectly shields one of the positive charges of the nucleus and makes this guy look like he's looking back at one plus charge instead of two. Makes him behave exactly like a hydrogen. So there's a take home lesson here. S electrons are very good at shielding the positive charge from the electrons above them. And that's in general true. So you have good shielding. The S electrons uh, block out the uh, nuclear charge. So, it, and it should, be, it should be kind of obvious to you uh, intuitively. Say, uh, say the party analogy. You are at a party. There's not many, many, very many people there. You get in. Say the dance floor is empty, and there's someone you find particularly attractive. <laughs> there's a nuclear attraction. Someone across the room. And it's easy to be attracted to them, the full attraction, because they are. Uh, there's no one in the way. Uh, let's say... <laughs> later in the party, the dance floor fills up with particles you find particularly repulsive. <laughs> Say, a bunch of Stanford trust fund babies. <laughs> then <laughs> you are less likely <laughs> to want to go in there to that species you're attracted to because of the repulsion in the rest of the room. Okay? And in this case, that repulsion is kind of perfect that you're able to fully protect, fully dispel one full positive charge by being in that 1s uh, orbital. So one of the implications of this is that the when you have more than one electron, so multi-electron species, the, the biggest impact for us is that the 2p orbital is actually slightly higher in energy, even though the principal quantum level more or less determines the total energy. It turns out L matters, and but L doesn't really matter. What matters is these S's below that p are shielding those 2p electrons so that these guys feel a slightly lower effective nuclear charge. They're being pulled less, so their energy is higher. It's easier to ionize them. They're moving up in energy. So this is why 2s fills when we're filling our orbitals before the 2p, because it is slightly higher in energy. So it's this S shielding effect that happens. S's are good shielders. If you're in the same principal quantum level, the two P's, they don't shield each other very well at all. And we kind of saw that for the one S. The S's, if you're in the same principal quantum level, if you're both S's, it's, there's some pretty good shielding. The P's don't shield very well each other at all. So putting a single P doesn't change the, the relative uh, p orbital energies. So S's are great shielders, and if you're in the same principle, if you're in the same uh, level L, you don't really shield each other. But here's uh, another effect. The d orbitals are also move up in energy because of a shielding effect. And it, it turns out that 3d moves so far up in energy it's actually a lower energy than a 4s. So if there are no electrons, if it's a one electron system, then the 3d is down here. If you have all these electrons in there and there's that shielding lowering that effective nuclear charge, then these electrons move up in energy, uh, these uh, electrons in these orbitals. So now when you fill, 
the orbital diagrams, you would actually fill 1s1, 1s2, 2s1, 2s2. You'd get out to 2p6, and then you go 3s2, 3p6, and then you would say, well, wait a minute. 3d is actually higher than 4s, so you'd go 3p6, 4s, 2, 3d, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and you'd go out to your 10d electrons. So the shielding effect, kind of important to us. So let's look again, since we've got back to our d orbitals. I, I mentioned last time that uh, uh, I didn't, uh, I wasn't too concerned if you knew the names of the d orbitals, but you should know the shapes of, or you should look at the shapes of the d orbitals. So here's uh, a d orbital the wave function, and again, it's oscillating, so you see the phases changing. And what we have, oh my goodness, that's an F. Let's go to, uh, let's go to a, uh, D. There's uh, a famous D orbital, that's the, this is called the DZ squared orbital. Remember, I don't care if you know these the M sub L designations of the D orbitals, but here's a D orbital. And you can see more nodes. I'm gonna rotate that one a little bit. So you can see here, <clears throat> this is kind of a donut and two lobes here. So there's a donut in the XY plane and two lobes above it in the plane. This is a, Are we on uh, this? Are you capturing my screen so they'll see these annotations? Camera? Okay, so I'm going to uh, draw some uh, annotations here. How many nodes are in this? That's a good exam question. It's a 3D orbital. So how many nodes? N minus one, two nodes in there. What kind are they? Are they radial, angular, both angular? Well, L. L equals two, because that's a D. So D means, and L is the number of angular orbitals, uh, nodes. So L is two, there are two total nodes, they're both angular, okay? Uh, that's what we see in this uh, orbital here. Um, I'd love to spend a minute and tell you why that's an angular <laughs> uh node. So what you have is this cone-shaped node here. I'll see if I can I'll see if I can draw it in. The node has kind of this cone shape. That's what makes this little donut thing here. So that cone-shaped node is your angular node. Uh, we call them angular nodes and radial nodes. Radial nodes you fix R. Remember the three coordinates? r theta phi, radial nodes you fix r to a certain value, say r equal one, and then you let every value of theta and phi be possible. So you have fixed radius, move theta and phi everywhere, you, you sketch out the surface of a sphere. That's a radial node. Angular nodes, you hold one of the angles constant and let r and the other angle vary. So if you did that with phi, the angle from the positive x, x axis, I let phi say be 90 degrees, come out to positive y, and then let r be anything, and theta from the plus of z axis be anything. That sketches out a plane. That's all the points in the y, z plane. What if theta, the angle from the positive z axis is held constant? So if I held the positive z axis, I go out here, Z is here, I go out here, theta, fix it, constant, and then let R vary, go out there to infinity, and then let phi vary, I sketch out this cone. And that cone is the angular node I see in the D orbital. Uh, let's look at another D orbital here, that's one of them. Let's look at another one because we're here. 
I feel bad that I said uh, I didn't care about them um, uh, too much. I, I, I don't not care about them. Um, I just don't care that you know their names. It, here's, here's the dx squared minus y squared. And it has, uh, it has nodes as well. The axes, z is coming out at you. And you can see that this orbital here has those two angular nodes, as you'd expect. And it has electron density uh, pointing out in the planes uh, of the xy plane. OK? So there they are. They matter quite a bit if you're doing complex chemistry. Uh, we just don't do a lot of complex chemistry in Chem 1. OK, lovely. So which of these has the lowest ionization energy now? So here are three options. Uh, A, B, C. Let's uh, talk through this together. So which has the lowest ionization energy? So the, the thing here, you look here and you say, these are all one electron species. Helium plus one electron, lithium plus one electron, lithium plus two, one electron. This has three positive charges. This has two positive charges in the nucleus. Hydrogen has one positive charge in the nucleus. Which is the easiest to ionize? Lowest ionization energy. So which electron is highest up on the energy level diagram? Closest to infinity. Well, here you have <clears throat> Z equal two, N equal two. Here you have Z equal two, N equal three. Here you have Z equal three, N equal four. And it's just one electron. So it's super easy to calculate the energy levels. It's just Z squared over N squared times uh, a Rydberg. So here are the three numbers. It's a one electron system. Hydrogen, one over two squared, a quarter of a Rydberg. The helium, two squared, four, that's Z, over three squared, nine. Four ninths, nearly half a Rydberg. And the lithium, nine sixteenths. N is four, squared is 16. Z is three, squared is nine. So this much energy, nine sixteenths, a little over a half, a little under a half of uh, a Rydberg and a quarter of a Rydberg. So I think the question was, which is the lowest of those? The lowest energy, the lowest ionization energy is hydrogen. So you see what we were doing there was we were, there were, we were, we were balancing things. We were going higher nuclear charge, but also higher quantum level. And it turned out, one electron system, that the higher nuclear charge was kind of winning. Even though you were going to higher principal quantum level, still the low principal quantum level was the lowest ionization energy. You went quite far away from the nucleus here out to four, and that was easier to ionize. Going way up this ladder, going up the ladder, increasing the nuclear charge didn't matter as much as the, uh, the N equal one for hydrogen. Which atom has the lowest ionization energy? Now I've got the atoms. So now there's the shielding part. So helium still in the 2P. The helium or hydrogen still in the 2p, helium still in the 3p, but it has its 1s electron there, so that's shielding the 3p. Lithium, 1s2, 4p electron. So an electron excited state in the 4 for lithium, but two shielding electrons there. Helium, one shielding electron. Hydrogen, no shielding electrons. Z effective is Z for this one. Z effective nuclear charge that that guy sees. We kind of already saw this one. We kind of know that that 1s electron beautifully shields one of the positive charges. So this is going to kind of look like 
a hydrogen, but in the three. So it's he's a, effectively plus one. And this guy, too, it has two electrons effectively shielding this electron out here in the 4p. So this electron also probably looks back, and he's there's three positive charges there, but there's those 1s electrons shielding it, so it effectively sees just one positive charge, much easier to ionize if you're out there in the 4. So now all that matters here is n, how far away you are, because they all see about one positive charge. So it just matters how far away you are. If you're farther away, you're easier to ionize. Higher energy, easier to ionize. So now it's the effective, and they all have about, about one effective charge. So if we say effective now z is one, that, then that's only uh, a ninth of a Rydberg. And again, Z is one that's only a 16th of a Rydberg, so it's easiest to ionize lithium. In that excited state, lithium. It's already in the 4P. Oh, here I do, here I do it. Like I said, I was going to do it on the exam. I'm going to depict ionization energy in terms of the kinetic energy of a photoelectron. So this is ejecting electrons versus the frequency of that electron. So we have these same three species. Which atom does the plot depict an ionized electron versus frequency? Now this one is tough. I'm saying the UV region is right there. And for this one, you have to go back <laughs> to that picture that showed you kind of the series of uh, of ionization energies. So we'll just talk through this together. Uh, so hydrogen ionizing uh, from the 2p, that's actually a visible photon. Uh, uh, from the two, oh no, ionizing from that, that is an ultraviolet photon. Um, I don't expect you guys uh, to know this level of detail. If this were on exam, you'd have to have lots of, you'd have to have some numbers to compare it to. Uh, let's just look at those numbers. What I was saying is, if you had this diagram, then you could say, oh, that's ultraviolet. And you would say, well, hydrogen in the 2P, hydrogen there, that is an ultraviolet. It does take more ultraviolet and more energy to ionize. So this is about right for hydrogen. Because this photon here, even staying in the atom, even going 5 to 2, that's an ultraviolet. So go from 2 to infinity, that has to be more than ultraviolet. So you need a photon out here, higher frequency than ultraviolet, to ionize it. And you could say that that electron would have this kinetic energy if you did that. But we already saw that these guys have lower ionization energies. So here's a great exam question. Draw those two on that plot. I'm not going to do it for you. Go home and do that. Draw the line for this guy and the line for this guy on this same plot, where they would be relative. Again, no numbers, so it's just qualitative where they would be. You should be able to do that. You definitely have to be able to do it by Monday. <laughs> Don't you hate that? <laughs> I leave that as an exercise. <laughs> it's the worst thing an instructor can say. <laughs> Go home and figure that out. <laughs> Ask your GSIs. <laughs> uh, oh, we've been talking about uh, Green Day and pulling teeth. That uh, song. Can we? Can you cue that up, uh, Andrew? So take everybody out of their their Zoom rooms. Cue that up at about 40 seconds in. So this song by Green Day was popular when I started teaching Chem 1, and I was listening to it, and I thought I thought one of the lines, I thought they were saying ultraviolet in one of the lines uh, in the song. And Andrew will play it for you right here. Um, is it playing? Yeah. Yeah, start at 40 seconds. Turn on your mic so I can hear where you are if you can. It doesn't matter too much. Go ahead, start it playing. <laughs> uh, 
did you hear that? <laughs> okay, you can bring the, the volume down there. So I'm in the car listening. And uh, I'm going, oh, my God, Green Day, my favorite band of the day, uh, singing about ultraviolet radiation. <laughs> cool. Uh, it turns out um, that's not what they're saying. Uh, they're saying ultraviolet. <laughs> it's a it's a song about abuse. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> but it sounded like ultraviolet to me. So I'm thinking uh you could cast those all those lyrics. You can put your lyrics up in the Zoom room, uh Andrew, if you want. Um I just uh rewrote the lyrics. Uh if it, they were singing about uh, ultraviolet radiation. So, uh here's the lyrics that I would have written if it actually were about ultraviolet radiation instead of uh, a, um, spousal abuse or whatever it's actually about. So, um, you, oops, this didn't uh, roll down all the way. But, uh, uh, well, I guess it's not very impactful unless someone actually sings it for you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, I'll 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 try to do some some Green Day for you. My impression. Uh, okay, I'm all busted up, broken bonds. I've come undone. Radiation will happen, and this time I've absorbed some. It's incident on me. And it's H new equals E. Can't you see it's the one that has me in excited states? Here it is. Is it ultraviolet? Am I perturbed? I better emit some energy in the form of a photon or two. You know it's H new equals E. For now, I'll lie around in my ground states where I'm found. Radiation can't touch me, everybody, unless H new equals E. <laughs> Fantastic little Green Day rendition. Oh, thank you from the from the gallery. <laughs> so uh, let's continue. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to cover a little periodic trends here, and I'm going to cover a little bit. Uh, Monday morning um, so that we have this periodic trend stuff on on the midterm. So read ahead, uh, look, do your reading, uh, be ready Monday. We'll do a little review of the Monday. Do your homework that says periodic trends on it. You can watch the video from last summer uh, where I talk about pretty periodic trends or on Ecamm if you can find that. We could actually post last summer's, I guess, if we want you guys can probably find it if you google it um i want to point out the periodic table is uh the structure of the periodic table was known since the middle ages a long time ago the 1500s maybe not quite that far but pretty darn far back 1600s people were working out the structure of this periodic table it turns out we got to quantum mechanics, and quantum mechanics perfectly predicts this. It's one of the huge triumphs of quantum mechanics. How does it do it? Well, you see the quantum structure of the periodic table immediately. These guys are S electrons filling. There's these two rows. Then there's these six columns filling P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, P6, ending a principal quantum level, going to the next one, 3S1, 3S2. And in the middle, the D electrons. How many D orbitals are there? Well, if L is 2, M sub L can be minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 5 D orbitals. That's room for 10 electrons. And lo and behold, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 D electrons. So that whole structure of the periodic table 
predicted, and they're in columns because their properties are similar. That's how they arranged it when the periodic table was being formed. Why are their properties similar? Because their outermost electrons are similar looking. All of these have P2 as their outermost electron. 2P2, 3P2, 4P2, 5P2. So they look similar. They have similar properties. The electrons out there at the outer shell have similar properties. These are S electrons are their outermost, their highest energy, largest quantum number electrons. So the chemical properties reflect the quantum mechanical wave functions that the electrons are occupying. And that's a great triumph of quantum mechanics. The F orbitals. How many F orbitals? There are <laughs> minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, three, seven. That's 14 electrons. And there are 14 columns in the F structure. The F structure plugs in here at lanthanum. Uh, it, it's kind of uh, F goes in here and it's pulled out to the side. We won't talk about that too much. Uh, Glenn Seaborg, our famous uh, patriarch and chemist uh, of Berkeley, uh, he determined that this structure of the periodic table should be where you put these elements. And of course, Seaborgian 106 is not even on there. <laughs> is it in there? Seaborgian 106, 5, 4, 6, there it is. Uh, Seaborgian named after uh, Glenn Seaborg element 106 and there's a berkelium and there's a californium uh there they are berkelium and californium uh as well all named for our beloved cal um so uh a lot of this we've talked about already but we're uh running out of time so i'm not going to dive into this i'm going to just cover this idea of electro the trend in ionization energy and the trend in electron affinity uh, Monday morning. Uh, it's a relatively straightforward uh, and easy thing to absorb, and there'll be some easy questions about it on the midterm, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, right now, I have office hours. It's Thursday, right? So we'll keep the live stream going. We'll bring the Zoom in, and you can ask your questions by Zoom. Um, I did not join the Zoom on this computer. Um, I'll I'll do that, uh, and uh, you guys can ask questions. Are there any questions coming in from uh, the chat or anything? Well, why don't we just stay on the chat? I don't, I don't want to run over there and do my Zoom right this second. Uh, <clears throat> Do one of you guys have a few minutes to stay and just read chat? Any questions coming in on the chat? Or if you want to, if you want to just ask, oh, are you in the Zoom? Uh, okay. Uh, again, Amanda, the question is, Amanda says, what should we know about the Fourier transfer in the midterm? Nothing. Remember I said, there's not many mathematics on the midterm. The reason we talked about the Fourier transform because it was an important property of waves. I want you to know the important property of waves, which was that the if you add up a bunch of different waves, you can get a very specific uh, frequency. So the uncertainty principle is essentially what you need to know about the Fourier transform. So nothing about the Fourier transform whatsoever except I was showing you it because it's a mathematical function. It works on waves, and therefore it works on matter when matter is behaving like a wave. And that was weird. So what you need to know is if you're spread out in space, you have a uncertainty in space, you can know very low uncertainty in momentum. So the, the uncertainty principle, the uncertainty in the position, and the uncertainty in the momentum are fixed at a constant. So if one gets bigger, the other gets smaller. That's what we need to know. And there was that chem quiz where we had the electrons going through a slit. We made it bigger or smaller the slit, and we saw the resulting spread in momenta. Good question. Uh, 
A uh, good question from who's that from? Amanda. <laughs> Amanda's the fastest typist. Uh, yes, Amanda asks, are uh, Angular nodes the same as planar nodes? Exactly. A planar node is an Angular node. You get that plane because you fix phi, that angle from the positive x axis. You can fix it at any number. Say you fix it at 45. Plunk. Then you let r and theta be any number. So r is how far you're out, and theta is this angle from positive z. If you do that with your arms, that traces out all the points in a plane. Other things? Uh, the general question is midterm one covered in midterm two. Uh, you're never off the hook for anything. Uh, but there's not going to be a, like a specific question on, you know, that's exactly a, a but you can't forget anything. Uh, so buyer beware. Other things? Okay, I can probably hang around Monday after lecture a bit too. Um, there uh, are review sessions. Again, many of you, it was so nice. Many of you went to the SLC, the Student Learning Center, and I'll post the link. I'll send an announcement out now. The SLC is doing another one of their excellent reviews. And I talked to those people. I said, um, here's what we're going to cover. Here's what you should emphasize. And I gave them all the chem quizzes. So I hope that was an effective review for you. I know last midterm was so tough, you feel like nothing helped. <laughs> That's not going to be the case this time. We're going to make sure. Uh, I'm, I'm literally looking at the chem quizzes. I'm looking at the homework, and I'm putting exam questions. And some of the exam questions you may have already done because they are uh, homework questions too. So you probably have seen some of them in there. Um, so uh, there are we having uh, one among us a review session? Have we decided yet? Uh, the the your UGSIs are are trying to decide if they can put one together for you as well. We'll post that uh, online. Uh, wasn't there something that somebody emailed me about this morning that said there should be an announcement? Uh, oh, eye clicker stuff. Uh, don't worry about your eye clicker stuff. We're getting, we'll get it sorted out. If you've used two different accounts and you've registered with B courses, you don't see anything uh, that matters in your B course gradebook about eye clicker yet. We're going to do it all at the end, but next week we're going to try and get it going so you can see at least some kind of running total that you are responding. So we'll try to acknowledge the fact that you are responding and that we're getting those responses. But if you've been pushing your button, uh, we're getting it. So you're there. Yes? So the question uh, from Lucille is the changing wavelength on the diffraction pattern. And um, yes, uh, short answer. Um, Let's just uh, go here. Let's just bring that uh, standby. Oops. Trap between worlds here. Oh, for goodness sakes. Uh, what do I have to do to get that on the other screen? Sorry, Lucille, give me a second. Uh, there's nothing I can do that can will get that over there for me. Uh, la, 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 la. Uh, okay, we might just have to go around the whiteboard. I was going to bring the demo up, but uh, the board is driving me crazy. So it's not letting me do what I want to do. That's all I wanted to do. Why was that so hard? Uh, let me get the uh, the animation up here. So this is um, diffraction. Uh, actually, I should go interference. Inter uh, interference and the wave nature of light. Is that the one? Yeah. Okay, I can't find it quick. So we'll just do it here on the whiteboard. Let me 
Which we have to turn into a blackboard. Already is. That's great. Um, so what we were saying was, uh, and Lucille's question is, Uh, what's the idea of the diffraction pattern and the wavelengths of light? The important thing about uh, the uh, patterns you see on a screen here versus the wavelength of light, the important thing is the uh, what happens if you change slits or wavelength. So let's do... Let's do a two-slit experiment here. We'll have green wavelength coming in. There are two effects you see here that are, are separable. There's the diffraction, and the diffraction gives you this overall envelope of intensity. There's the interference, and the interference gives you the dark and bright spots here. So bright spot, dark spot, bright spot, dark spot. Bright spot, dark spot. Okay? The interference comes from the fact that a wave coming from here, there's a really neat demo that I did find, uh, interactive demo that I did find on the web, that it allows you to interactively move that spot and change the wavelength. And it has the two waves coming in, so you can see how they add right here. But there's two possible waves that can hit that spot. And at that spot, one of the waves, since that's a dark spot, one of the waves is at a peak, and the other wave is at a trough, and they add up at that spot to destructive interference, and that makes a dark spot. B bright spot, the opposite. They add up, and they're both. So here... Where there's a bright spot on the screen, the two the two waves add up at that bright spot. They're both up. That wave is up, and that wave is up, and they constructively interfere and give you that bright spot. So you can see, if the wavelength is different, the wavelength, well, now I'm erasing that's a green wavelength, say there's a different wavelength along this other path, then that red wavelength is longer. So it matters how much different these paths are to get the, the peaks and valleys to overlap. So you have to go to a bigger relative difference between the two to get the peak and valley, the, the valley on this one and the peak on this one to overlap right there, you had to go farther up the screen if you increased the wavelength. So the diffraction pattern looked like it spread out. Uh, and I should say it more precisely, the interference pattern looks like it spread out. The diffraction, overall, just that envelope, that we explained, that was really important, we explained it by the uncertainty principle. So we can just have one slit, and we said, if you have a wave-like property coming in here, how tightly do the photons stay? How tightly collimated? Uh, how coherent are they when they strike the screen there? And that depended on how wide the slit was. Because we said, well, let's say it looks like that with, with this slit. We said, well, if you make it narrower, then delta x, the spread in possible x position, got smaller. Oops, it just got smaller didn't get less than zero. So there's a smaller spread here. But that means the spread in x 
momenta, momenta in the x direction, had to get bigger because they're locked together by the uncertainty principle. So going through this small slit, it was you were less certain about their x momenta. They could have more, a larger spread in x momenta. So smaller slit, more precise here, means bigger spread in momenta, and that means you got a bigger. They got spread out more in the x dimension by the time you got there. Okay. Good question, Lucille. All good uh, exam type questions. Yes. Good question. Wow. The only s orbitals have radial nodes. Uh, you love the s orbitals. They're those uh, beautiful spheres. Uh, no. So L tells you the number of angular nodes, and N tells you the number of total nodes. So short answer, no. Long answer, you have to know. <laughs> you must know this. One, one of the, there, I don't want to ask you anything math about quantum mechanics. I have to ask you about the quantum numbers and the nodes. That's how you can describe the wave functions to me. Okay, you'll also try to recognize pictures on the exam, but I can't draw great 3D pictures. So you have to know about the nodes and the quantum numbers to tell me what you know about uh, quantum mechanics. So N minus one is total nodes. So if you have a N equal five, you have four total nodes. How many of them are radial and how many of them are angular? Well, you can tell because L is the total angular. The rest are radial. So if N is five, then there are four nodes. If L is zero, that is, if you're in an S, so if you're in a four, excuse me, you're in a five S, five S, four total nodes in that S orbital. How many of them are angular? None of them. They're all radial. L equal four is the biggest L you can have. N equal five, L equal four, four total nodes, L equals four, they're all angular. And in between, it's a mix of angular and radial. Good question. When we discussed it, how is it energetically favorable for them to be parallel? Because they have the same spin and momentum and one of them is like actually a quantum mechanics. Oh, brilliant. Who's asking that? Uh, Swati. Ah. <laughs> I've, I've spoken to Swati personally, and uh, <laughs> she asked a brilliant question then, too. Yes. Uh, the question is um, what about this spin thing? Um, uh, what about this spin being parallel? M sub S has two possible values, plus one half and minus one half. And we're saying we're associating that with some magnetic property. Okay, so it's similar to an electronic property. Uh, and uh, Swathi saying, well, the idea is if you have two plus one halves, if they're the same spin, why don't those repel? And the answer is uh, we're, we're talking about a, um, uh, a magnetic phenomena. So if you have, if you're spread out in space here, and you know this, if you have, uh, oh boy, you don't know this very well. Uh, if you have a bunch of magnets and you want to uh, align them in a low energy situation and they're spread out in space, you would have all the magnets with their north poles uh, facing up. <laughs> if, oh boy, that, that isn't a good, there isn't a great analogy to that. Uh, you would have north, south, north, south, north, south. If there were some overall magnetic field, all of them would line up like that. And that would be the lower energy situation. So I guess that's the analogy. If there were some giant magnetic field in the in the atom, and there is, uh, so it, it, there's electric fields in the atom, so that means there must be magnetic fields. 
uh, if the elect uh, if there's moving electric fields. But this is the best way to think about it. If there's some overall uh, north-south magnetic field, then that parallel arrangement is the best one. All of them arranged parallel. That's the lower energy. Notice that these are in different orbitals, though. When you try to put them in the same orbital, then they're, then it's it's as you say, it's better in the same orbital if you bring two magnets together. Click, the best way is one north south, one south north, so they stick together. Okay, that's very hand wavy because it's not a magnetic. <laughs> Turns out it's not a magnetic property. Uh, it it has these magnetic characteristics, and that's that's great. But the reason this happens can be explained uh, quantum mechanically uh, apart from the actual uh, magnetic field in, in, in interaction. Okay, good question. Other things? Yes. Um, is radiating the same as emitting? For example, in reference to perfect radiators we talked about earlier, is it correct to say they emit from the entire electromagnetic spectrum? Uh, the question is, is radiating and emitting the same? In general, yes. Um, uh, how should you say, uh, how should you say if anything's a perfect radiator? If it's a perfect radiator, I will tell you. Um, perfect radiator is a mathematical construct. There aren't any real perfect radiators or perfect emitters. Um, we talk about these things called black bodies or perfect emitters. Um, well, we do it for mathematical convenience, and then we can mathematically plot those emission spectra that we gave you. But in general, if something's emitting, it's also radiating. That's true. But we're going to talk about, for the most part, discrete emission, discrete radiation events, single photons. I want you to tell me what photon, what energy is being emitted, one photon, the farthest possible from every photon. All right, fantastic, guys. Good luck. We'll see you all Monday morning.